Hi, George. So nice to see you. Um, hey, hi, how are you? Great. I know you're in Berlin. Yeah. Um, and um, I'm, I was so excited to have a chance to play your piece, Mangle of Practice, for Library of Congress. Um, and I know it was um, premiered there and commissioned by the McKim Foundation. Um, and I was hoping you could tell me a little bit about the piece. Well, you know, it's a funny title, The Mangle of Practice. Um, it sort of started at a conference that I went to, a, a sort of a 10-day conference at University of Oxford, and uh, convened by the sociologist Georgina Bourne. And one of the people who I really resonated with was the sociologist of science, Andrew Pickering, who was a real music head. And in his talk, he referenced people like Alvin Lussier and Bill, Philip Glass. And I thought, oh, wow, this is very interesting. So we got to talking more. And then I started reading his work, his work on agency and, and performativity and how, and so I felt these were pretty important concepts. And he has a very important book called The Cybernetic Brain, which of course resonates with a lot of things I do with technology. But the essay, uh, the, his essay, The Mangle of Practice, um, he's talking about the word mangle in two senses. You know, uh, The first sense is like this idea of resistance and accommodation, as he calls it. You know, human purposes, agencies, aspirations, you know, interact with the material world. So you can't really draw a bright line between human and material agency. And that's something you also find in like Bruno Latour's kind of ideas and in the, um, uh, the idea of actor network theory. So I think that the piece is sensitive to those dynamics of human and material expressions of agency, which I think comes up whenever you play an instrument particularly when you're playing it in the ways that you are playing it in this piece. But the other way, the other notion of the mangle, it's a British thing. It refers to, I don't know if you had these things when you were a kid, but I did, you know, they call them in ringers on the washing machine. So what happens is it's a, it's a, it's a, it's as you crank this thing and it's these two rollers and it's a way of drying, near drying your clothes but it also destroys your clothes because it, it, it presses them into this really flat thing. It mangles them. <laughs> and so a lot of the sounds in the piece refer to that sense of mangling as well. Oh, interesting. I thought it was because it was really a difficult piece and that the expectation was that uh, the instrumentalists would, uh, the performers would mangle the piece. <laughs> or the performers would be mangled by the piece. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, one of the things that I kind of love about the piece is that it works a lot going back and forth um, between, uh, well, first of all, it's very specific with pitches. And I feel like um, you, or personally, I felt like that shape mm -hmm. macro ways and in micro ways. But the interesting thing to me is also mm -hmm. how they're treated. Um, not only rhythmically, but a lot in terms of sound, like with soltasto or ponticello. Um, so that kind of framework of pitch um, is both compressed and expanded rhythmically, but in a sense also in terms of sound waves, in terms of um, uh, the different kind of extended techniques used on the violin. Yeah, I mean, the, another aspect of the piece that I don't know if I've talked about with people because a lot of the writing is really high, right? And so what you wind up with, it reminds me of that generation of basketball players who they said played above the rim. You know, Michael Jordan, uh, I think Dominique Wilkins was one of them. Uh, uh, the first one maybe was uh, Dr. J, Julius Irving. I'm not a real big basketball fan, but at that time I was really influenced by that legacy of players who did that. And so it always seemed as though, so that's where you are is way above the rim. And occasionally you do a slam dunk by going to the lower register and playing some crunchy sound or something. I mean, it's, it's very, if you listen to it in that way, it becomes, a, you know, very much a material, a material moment, you know, it's not conceptual. It's supposed to be crunchy and, and punchy and, um, and noisy. And uh, so that's, 
the sense in which I think you were doing it, at least when I heard you play it the other day, you know, it's, in, it's intense and uh, it should be like, you know, biting this, biting into some huge sandwich and, uh, and just kind of uh, with big teeth and crunching into it. It was great to have it. I mean, I know everything is remote, so um, to have that chance to do a rehearsal with you um, mm. and I and you gave us a little bit of um, the genesis of some of the extended techniques in the piano, um, but I was hoping you could kind of um, I mean, I know people will hear it in the performance and we did do some shots inside the piano so people could actually see what Tom Sauer, the pianist, um, is oh, doing right. inside the piano. Um, but could you kind of, um, I guess I'm just curious, how did you first hear this? It's not even about when did you first hear the sound, but when did you f hear the sound and then feel like, um, you wanted to incorporate that into um, a kind of larger piece with with multiple sounds, like like I guess one we call it traditional um, piano playing, um, and and how so what made you kind of connect those two things together? I guess. Yeah. Well, you know, this allows me that question allows me to give a shout out to the great pianist and the great pianist Richard Valetudo. And he was, we were teaching together in, uh, in Los Angeles. And just in between sessions, I think Anne LeBaron had showed us how to do certain kinds of harp gusandi and things of that sort. And so I just, he's just started saying, well, here's something cool you could do. And he pulled out this ceramic cup and he started making these glissandi and these glassy sounds. And I just said, well, let me film this, right? So I took out my phone and sort of filmed it. And so when people ask me like how they how did how is that supposed to sound, I usually send them a copy of the film. Maybe maybe I shouldn't have admitted that, but um, <laughs> but it's been quite a while since that's happened, and so that film is probably all over the world. So maybe it helped them. But anyway, it certainly helped me. And so the first time I actually was able to use that idea, because I usually use I sort of reuse things, you know, like les, you know, I just things aren't unique to a certain piece. I I say, well, maybe how would that look in this context? So I think the, I think it was 2012 Nemosis uh, chamber piece uh, was using that. That's two years before your piece. And so now I'm out of the period. So I'm not doing it now, but it might come back some other time if I feel it's really necessary because it blends really well with the high notes, with the high notes on the, um, on the violin as well as other sounds on harp, things, certain kinds of percussion, like bowed crotales. It's a very useful thing. It's indeterminate and it's very beautiful. And then the other thing that Tom is doing, I think, uh, the plucking, which uh, at first looks like you can't do it, but then I think he figured out how to do it. Oh, he was so, really stressed about it. Maybe I should <laughs> But he figured out how to do it. So he's one of the two people in the world who have, have done that, you know, him and Winston Choi, who, <laughs> for whom the, the piece, along with uh, Ming, Ming Wan Chu, th those were, was, the piece was written for them. So you are all the only, I think you are the only, the second duo that's played this. Oh, really? Oh. And it's a, I, think it's, yeah, I think so. It's a real achievement, you know. I feel so honored. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Very happy he's doing it. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's see. I don't know. I guess um, maybe that's it. Is there anything else that I should ask you about? Uh, like I don't know. Under, under, like I could just say that I was just at the, this piece was um, made for the ensemble Daliente, with whom I've had a very special relationship. And, um, but it also works very well with you. And in part because you have the temperament for this piece, you know, I've seen you play and it's like com on stage at like Miller Theater or somewhere. It's a combination of being a whirling dervish and like super virtuosic fire and all these kinds of things. So that's, that's why it works so well. And I'm really happy that you're doing it, especially doing it there because 
this piece was premiered at the Library of Congress. And since then, I've gotten a chance to go back and, you know, David Plyler is in particularly supportive and I got a chance to give a lecture there recently. So I, I kind of feel at home there. So I kind of feel my music is at home there. And so thank you for bringing it back home. That's what I would say. Thank you. Well, we're all there remotely. Um, I had to record it in a separate studio, um, mm. but it will be uh, the performance is streaming on November 19. Wow. Um, so I hope everybody can join that concert and um, hear George's piece. I'm going to be there. Yay. <laughs>